So, sort of already drew this figure. Uh, I do want to, uh, we talked about, when we were talking about Moore's circle the other day, I think there was a little bit of a discussion about um, how we can use mud weight to basically stabilize a wellbore. And I think I misspoke to say that, um, you know, sigma theta theta was only controlled by the far field stresses, that there was no dependence upon delta P or the, or the mud weight, and that only by increasing the mud weight, by increasing the mud weight, only sigma theta RR would go, would move this way, which would cause the more circle to shrink. Uh, that, that's not true. If you go back and look at the equations, both sigma theta theta and sigma RR have delta P dependence, okay? So, in fact, what happens when you increase the mud weight is both, you know, sigma RR increases, sigma theta theta decreases, moving the more circle, you know, shrink, still shrinks the more circle, but from from both sides, okay, and and that'll give the add some stability, okay. So basically, uh, on this figure, and this is this is the same pro, the same uh, sort of numbers we, we're working with, the same numbers, okay. In this case, this region here indicates use a different color. This region here. In indicates the total region in which breakouts would occur according to some failure model, okay? And so in the, in the more plot, basically all of the stress values in the red region as I've drawn it on the right correspond to stress evaluations in terms of a more Coulomb failure model that would be over there, okay? And, and so therefore, you would have failure. Now, in this case, these lines are drawn for some single value of, some single value of uh, unconfined compressive strength, right? In terms of like where these wellbore breakout regions would occur, okay? However, we can also plot it, and that's what's done here. If you look at the color contours, if you look at the color contours, what they re represent is the required, the required unconfined compressive strength, such that you to, to not get breakouts, if you will. So, in other words, if you don't want any breakouts in your wellbore at all, you'd need, you know, at the, the maximum value out there is like 150. So you'd have the rock strength would have to be like 150 megapascal at that, you know, the ultimate strength of rock, or unconfined compressive strength of rock would have to be like 150 megapascal to not get any breakouts anywhere. Okay. So there's a couple different ways we can look at these things. Typically also, this, this indicates the WBO is the breakout width. It's typically expressed in terms of an angle. So, Whatever this angle is, is WBO. So it's the angle associated with the breakouts that will occur. And the breakouts will always occur in pairs, right? Because the stress is identically the same here as it is there. Okay, so the breakouts will always occur in pairs on either side of the wellbore. Okay. So you remember when we were just introducing stress or why we like to use the, you know, the sort of uh, the principal stress field in the earth is a convenient one. And it's convenient because we can be fully characterized with essentially the three values and one horizontal principal stress direction. So where breakouts occur in a wellbore are actually an indication of one horizontal principal stress direction. Which one? SH min. I'm going to ask you that multiple times. Right? So, so yeah. So if we go and, you know, if, if you don't have any other information about the, uh, if you go and drill a wellbore and you, and you, vi you know, see breakouts, and we'll talk about it in a second, how you might see them, 
But if you go and you drill a well and, and you're actually seeing breakouts, they're an indication of the direction, the vertical well, right, the vertical well. They're an indication of the direction of SH min. And so therefore, now you know one of your you know, directions and you can, if you have um, some other information then, you know, from, from testing or other things, then you can also determine the, the stress values, right? And the way you can do that was you can, if you, if you approximately know that, well, if you know that there's breakouts occurring, right, if you know that there's breaks out, breakouts occurring, and you know what the unconfined compressive strength of the rock is, then you can sort of solve the equation backwards, right? You can solve the equation for, you know, the only, depending on a, the exact scenario, but you can possibly solve it to, for SH max or SH min if you just had one of the other values, right? to characterize the stress on the earth. So I think I really just already talked about this, but the idea here is that, you know, if I, again, by increasing delta P, sigma RR moves that way, sigma theta theta moves that way, shrinking the Mohr circle, bringing it off the failure line. Remember, the failure line is a material property, essentially. It comes from the unconfined, the cohesion, which is related to the unconfined compression strength, and the slope, which is related to this internal friction. Those are essentially material properties, right? So that's going to stay stationary. We increase delta P, shrink the Mohr circles, and then, you know, if you look at the plot now, the required CO to not experience breakouts is much lower, right? So, and the breakout width is narrowed, okay? So typically, um, you'll almost always see breakouts when you drill a well. It's, it's, it's virtually impossible not to because it's such a large stress intensity right at the wellbore wall. But just because you see breakouts doesn't mean you're going to have an unstable wellbore. So, there's typically some acceptable level of breakouts. Right? There's some, you know, maybe 30, 40, 50, 60 percent, depending on how, I'm sorry, 30, 40, 50, 60 degrees. Right? Remember, this is, this is measured in terms of an angle. So usually we'll, we'll you know, have some, some acceptable amount, 30, 40, 50, 60 percent, something, 60 degrees, something like that. Um, you know, it just depends on how conservative you want to be before you want to declare the wellbore, you know, unstable and set, set casing or something, you know, set a new casing or something like that. Uh, so you'll almost always see them, and then of course we can add stability by, by just shrinking the, uh, we can add some stability from the mud weight, and that will basically decrease the required CO such that you wouldn't see breakouts and decrease the breakout width if they were occurring. So we, we sort of already talked about this, but here's the, the actual uh, simplification. So if we evaluate the Kirsch equations at the wellbore wall, that's when the ratio A over R equals to 1. So at the wellbore wall, at the wellbore wall, A over R equals to 1, then the equations simplify, as I mentioned already multiple times, sigma RR just becomes delta P, the difference in the mud weight and the pore pressure. Um, sigma theta theta simplifies to this equation. Uh, sigma ZZ becomes this equation. And again, you can see uh, that sigma theta theta does have a dependence on delta P. So if I increase delta P, if I increase delta P, I move sigma R, R, I, I, I essentially increase sigma RR, and since there's a negative sign right there, if, I in, if everything else is the same and I increase delta P, then this gets smaller. But with that, we can, you know, with these simplified equations at the wellbore wall, we can determine where sigma theta theta and sigma 
ZZ will be maximal by just looking at you know, basically the, the maximum of, and minimum of cosine 2 theta. Right? This is a sinus, you know, it's a periodic function which oscillates between some maximum and minimum value. And so sigma theta theta has a minimum at 0 and at 180, and therefore the equation simplifies to that. Right? So that's where the minimum will be. And at the maximum, it, it has a maximum at 90 and 270. And then this equation simplifies to that. So look, we're, we're looking at sigma theta theta's minimum and maximum value, which is corresponding to where cosine 2 theta has a minimum and maximum value. Okay. And so then if we add those two together, if we just add this equation to that equation, then you get this final equation that says that the, the difference between the minimum and maximum hoop stress, sigma theta theta, is equal to four times the difference in the principal stresses. Okay. So the difference in the principal stress and stresses really governs the strength of the oscillation of the hoop stress as you go around the orbit. 